We've heard much about the power of nature. Now it's man who calls the shots. We shape this country at our whim, not because we are reckless, but because we have the power. In conquering this land, we have burned inconvenient vegetation, landscaped boring hills. Cleared the earth of big ugly trees and even created mighty rivers with dams to run the power we need for toothbrushes, crock pots and weed eaters. We've even drowned towns to make this power. This was Cromwell before the mighty dam was built here in the late 70s. These days it's underwater Meanwhile, the power generated lights up apartments in P-Labs as far away as Auckland. But we've run out of towns to drown, so now we must look to new technology, like wind farms. Although sheep, children and llamas are often killed by these giant propellers, they do provide clean energy. However, when the wind changes direction, they actually suck power out of the national grid. It's now believed that this was the cause of the Great Auckland Power Blackout of 1998. The catastrophe hit during one of the most popular TV shows of the time. Most places fine. There's the high. There should be an H in there. It slowly comes on and... But Auckland is pulled together with a blitz-like spirit. People like shopping with the torches that we have. Um, it's a bit of fun. It's something different. Yeah, we've had a great response. It's not normal, uh... Uh, I've been sucking the tap, but anyway, I enjoy it. The motor car is the ultimate symbol of power. It's a throbbing, gas-guzzling machine that will one day help to extinguish all life as we know it. But still, who can resist the pure joy of putting one's foot down? In the 1960s, 30% of New Zealanders lost their virginity in one of these. It's a trekker, the New Zealand purpose-built virginity-losing machine. All great nations have their automotive icons. The Americans had the Model T, the Australians the Holden, the RX-3 from Japan, but New Zealand had its very own vehicle, and this is it. The Trekker was our most successful locally made car, a two-wheel drive that looked like a four-wheel drive. Some 3,000 of these shonky Skoda SUVs were made in the 60s and 70s. It may have been the most prolific, but the Trekker wasn't our only indigenous automobile. Back in the 1920s, there was the Carlton. It was our first motoring misfire and only two were made. The Crow the Toiler was another great failure. Named after the man who made it, race car driver Rolly Crowther, it featured gullwing doors, but it couldn't fly. Commuting around Auckland and these will be fantastic. You'll save all the time on the Harbour Bridge and it'll be great. Today, Alan Gibbs is known for his rich boy toy, the Aquada. But in the 1960s, Gibbs was the man behind the ill-fated non-starter, the Anzeal Nova. But best of all was the Magnum Spectre. Based on the awesome power of a Morris 1300, it was a sci-fi muscle car that, true to form, never went into production. Sadly, the Kiwi car industry never flew, and by the 1980s, imported cars had inundated the country. It helped fuel the firestorm of boy racer culture, but one of our most powerful men was having none of it. The man known as Banksy was on a mission to clean the filth from the streets of Auckland. Auckland Mayor John Banks, Police Minister George Hawkins and his superintendent here to feel the mood of the city. I don't want them to witness vomiting, fighting, dogs, gypsies selling rubbish, urinating and drunkenness. We don't want it. 
Like the gypsies, the boy racers showed Banks little respect. That's my name. We're selling them 50 cents a pop. We're making a, we're making a sale tonight. You're making the video, right? Why do you come here? Pizza people, um, ever snare, it's good. It's cars, nice cars, nice guys. This is, I oh don't know, something for us to do. You come in here at what, it's regularly? Just, it's just to get together, yeah. Somewhere to go, that's what you come here for. Oh yeah, it's a bit of action. Hanging out in cars in the main street has long been a tradition in New Zealand and seems likely to remain so until the oil runs out in 2009. Yeah. What do you think about the mayor who says he wants to get you out of the street? Everyone to their own opinion. Yeah, we could, we could say that we want some of the people out of the, in the um, parliament or, you know. Yeah. Um, don't know. Myself, I'm not undesirable. Yeah, a lot of fun. Well, I mean, you all this yahooing and that he had in the paper, well, you'll expect that in any town, eh? 6,500 fight fans packed the Patoni Recreation Ground to see the Murphy Calto fight for the New Zealand... But Rugby. long before hot rods and pimped-out daiwus, people turned out in their hundreds to witness the unleashing of a more primal form of power. Hanging on to Murphy and Murphy go back in the center of the ring. There's an intoxicating but brutal beauty to the spectacle of one man beating another to a bloody pulp. Gadsworth with his left right and catches him another left hook and another left hook steadies him with the right and another left hook from Murphy. Another left hook from Murphy and Cowdo staggers on him. Murphy thumped the shit out of the dark-haired man with the foreign name in an exhibition that made the fight for life look like a celebrity circle jerk. It was a good clean fight and uh, I'm very pleased to run the worldwide title. I've covered it for some time. Thank you. Exhibitions of physical power continued to capture the hearts of Kiwis and came in all shapes and sizes. Graham May and Precious McKenzie were the elfin ebony and enormous ivory of New Zealand weightlifting par excellence. From gold medals to golden kiwis, Precious was always ready to lend a helping hand, lifting weights or indeed numbered baubles. <laughs> First prize, one oh one five three two. One oh one five three two. For Graham May, fame came unlike pride does after a fall. May gave up lifting and gave himself to another, more divine form of power. Graham's a member of the Open Brethren Assemblies, an assorted group of independent congregations who share a common philosophy. He can see the funny side of that near miss when 187 and a half kilos almost landed in the chief referee's lap. Moments later, he made the biggest lift of his career and won the gold. But as we'll soon see, power not only corrupts, it corrupts absolutely. To Kiwis who grew up in an anti-nuclear country, it may seem odd to think that it's a New Zealander we have to thank for unleashing the most devastating power ever created by man. In 1910, Ernest Rutherford became the first man to split the atom, initiating a new epoch in human history from his modest rooms at Canterbury University in Christchurch. This is Rutherford's den. This is where he split the atom. And believe it or not, this is the actual atom that Rutherford... Rutherford's breakthrough has long been a source of pride for New Zealanders. 
However, according to some historians, the Nobel Prize winner should not take all the credit. A lot of the groundwork for Rutherford was laid down by a man called Percival Ward Smythe, a young physicist from Dunedin. Ward Smythe was years ahead of Rutherford in terms of atomic research. He never actually split the atom, but he did manage to fracture it slightly, and this paved the way for Rutherford. Ward Smythe loosened it in much the same way someone loosens a jam jar, but it's the next person who actually opens it, so he missed all the glory. We may have taken pride in Rutherford's achievement, but years later, New Zealand would want nothing to do with nuclear power. We even sent one of our waterborne symbols of power, the warship Otago, into the Pacific to protest against French nuclear testing. But being Kiwis, we simply stood around and gawped. Then Prime Minister Norman Kirk spoke on the ship's return. It is not dangerous, but it is powerfully effective in that for the first time, other countries and larger countries are having their attention diverted to this particular situation. The great national figure is our big norm, the hero and the communist. Big Norm. Kirk was affectionately known as Big Norm, as he was apparently very well endowed. Norman's king of New Zealand, land of lambs, big fat lambs. He was also one of our most powerful leaders and one of the few to die while in office, sparking rumours that the CIA had assassinated him. Bill Rowling took over but was seen as a little weakling. He was ousted by a Kiwi power broker par excellence, Bob Jones. He focused uh, the campaign, or his campaign and the Capital Club's campaign, onto the denigration of me in, in, in quite a, a personal and, I felt, extremely objectionable way. I must say, I regret a lot of it. It was going too far, in hindsight. Um, it was intended as ridicule, of course, but it was pretty cruel ridicule. Jones is the quintessential self-made mogul. From state house to state dinners, this property investor went on to become one of the most powerful political dabblers in our political dabbling history. By fighting rolling, Jones helped get Muldoon into power, and he would rule over us like a crazed Eastern Bloc dictator for years to come. So much so that Jones formed his own party, the New Zealand Party, with the sole aim of ousting Muldoon. What began as a gripe became a crusade, what Bob Jones irreverently refers to as divine political service. And Muldoon was grilled in his post-cabinet press conferences. He said, oh, Jones is just having you on. I remember I was in Christchurch, and they came to me and said, he's just said this, so I bugger it, so I have to do it now, and didn't enjoy it one little bit. I'm real angry at the moment, real angry. I've just watched television news grossly misrepresented, and I've just about had a guts for I don't see any point in these meetings anymore. I might be calling it off tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, that was the words. And I've had a guts for so what, are you actually seriously considering quitting, or is this just anger? Oh, I'm not going on with her anymore. What's the point? We'll be coming in pretty slowly. Uh, we'll have this rocky theme music playing loudly. I no doubt it'll be very quiet because I've stressed that it should be very loud, so I imagine it'll be very quiet and you won't be able to hear it. Um, so I'll have to go and talk to her. Who's in charge of the music? So I can right, talk you to we are too. No, we, yes. we, 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 we're clear on, on, on the opening of the programme and the music to, and the sense yeah. of atmosphere that you want. You, you, want know, a, you want a spotlight at the top. Well, if you let right? me tell you, I can tell you what we want, all right? Because right. it'll save a hell of a lot of time because you keep telling me what we want. His message? cleanse the country of the government of Sir Robert Muldoon. And then he has become history's greatest ever borrower and, of course, history's greatest ever financial failure. And he will be remembered, in my view, both as a remarkable figure, as he undoubtedly is in our political history, but as the idiomen of economics. The plan worked. Like rolling before him, Jones had a firm hand in Muldoon's downfall. The total vote for National Party and, and Bob Jones Party exceeded the vote for Labor. So you'd have to say um, that he made a difference. But you've got to, got to ask yourself, what would happen if he wasn't in the mix? Would people have stayed with National or would their second preference after Bob Jones have been 
the, uh, the, the Labour Party. And I think you'd have to say that a majority of that vote would have gone Labour's way because people really had had enough by uh, 1984. G'day. Last day today? Last day today. All the best for the new year. Anything. Well, we'll, we'll see you again. Bound to. <laughs> Anybody who comes in thinking that it's all about power is an idiot. Do you ever feel sorry for them, though? If you took someone apart, did you ever... Well, uh, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. It's a tough game. My problem, frankly, is with women MPs. I've uh, still got that old-fashioned idea that you mustn't be unkind to a woman. You, you know, if she's in trouble, you give her a little pat. <laughs> Boy, it's a bit difficult to pat some of the present lot. <laughs> There's nobody here. Hey? There's nobody here. Look at that. There's some... Um... Well, it's a great farewell party. It's not. Ha, ha, ha. Well? Yep. Good luck. Happy retirement, Rob. <laughs> so tell him to stop clapping there. Cheers. 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 You know, to be perfectly correct these days, shouldn't you say it? <laughs> <laughs> On his death in 1992, Muldoon received one of the true trophies of power. He was given a state funeral. But Piggy, as he was affectionately known, had already been given another great honour. Mr Muldoon's always been well known as having a good head for money matters and an Auckland businessman seems to be proving that his reputation is well deserved. The piggy bank sold in the thousands and is still the most successful icon of its type ever made. Years later, the Paul Holmes and Winston Peters dog chews came on the market, but sales were disappointing. Most people gave them to their dogs, but I didn't. While Winston Peters had his face immortalised in latex, our truly great Maori leaders have had their faces immortalised in moko. One such leader was Tu Hawaiki, King of the Bluff. He was also known, though much more widely, as Bloody Jack, simply because of his uh, long association with whalers and sealers out of Port Jackson, and his persistent use of the Australian adjective. Bloody Jack's story was the basis of an animated film strip recently discovered by the Film Archive. Until the late 19th century, women were mostly powerless in New Zealand society. The only females allowed in Parliament were prostitutes known as chamber whores. But in 1893, New Zealand made history by becoming the first country in the world to give women the vote. It was girl power long before the Spice Girls. Much is made of the fact that New Zealand was the first country in the world to give women the vote. What is often overlooked is the fact that the same legislation also gave the vote to dogs and sheep. Sweeping changes resulted in a bewildered electorate. The confusion peaked in 1897 when a dog was elected to Parliament. Records show the Terrier Cross attended three cabinet meetings before being stood down. This is Frankie, the great, 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 great grandpup of our only parliamentary pooch. 
Sadly, dogs can no longer be voted into Parliament, although all manner of mankind is now welcomed into the corridors of power. In 1999, New Zealand achieved another first, electing a very different type of woman, the first transsexual to government. I was quoted once as saying that this was the stallion that became a gelding and now she's a mare. I suppose I do have to, <laughs> I do have to say that I've now found myself to be a member. And, um... <laughs> For the media, she was an object of curiosity and Genevieve Westcott couldn't help herself. What was it like having sex the first time? Did it feel very different from having sex as a man? Yes. But Georgie isn't the strangest politician to enter our parliament, which is now crawling with pot smokers, homosexuals, brawlers, oompa loompas, teletubbies, albinos, and some who possibly come from other planets. There's little doubt that many powerful forces have played their part in forging New Zealand. Whether it be the forces of nature or the follies of man, power in all its forms has defined this country. Our Aotearoa, land of power.